Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to give you all a very well, warm welcome, and thank you for braving the first Friday of the last quarter uh, <laughs> of the year and, uh, and of the last quarter ever. Um, so th uh, thank you so much for coming. I am very, very, very pleased to be opening the festivities today. Uh, and festivities indeed they are because this is the first event uh, where we're having the benefit of the co-sponsorship of the Instituto Camões from Portugal. As you may, uh, as you may know, uh, OSU celebrated a memorandum of understanding with Portugal's Instituto Camões in the last two years. And uh, this is the first year where uh, we're uh, receiving uh, their funding, and this is the very first uh, event that has received co-sponsorship from the Instituto Camões. But also, uh, I would like to thank the Center for Latin American Studies very much because their uh, co-sponsorship was instrumental for uh, uh, for this event. And I'd like to thank uh, the Center for Latin American Studies for their help setting this up. Uh, uh, so uh, we're all very grateful. I would like also to thank the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and the uh, coordinators of 840 for uh, their contribution and for uh, uh, helping in recruiting some uh, audience. Um, and, um, yes, thank you. <laughs> the Department of History also for their uh, co-sponsorship. I don't know if there's anyone here from history today. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I was gonna I was gonna talk about uh, Professor Stanley like in a second, but uh, please don't take offense. Uh, uh, but I am very thankful to, uh, to the Department of History for not only their co-sponsorship but also for sending us some of their uh, some of their own. Uh, I should have begin my uh, acknowledgments to Professor. Uh, um, um, Luis Felipe de Lencastro. Uh, I'm very thankful that he was gracious to accept our inv invitation and uh, come visit us from UMass Dartmouth, where he's staying uh, for the remaining of the, the, their spring semester as a visiting professor from the University of Paris, Sorbonne. Uh, last, but certainly not the least, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Stanley Blake very much for his willingness to uh, drive all the way from Lima to, so that he could introduce our speaker today. Uh, uh, it is very important, his presence here is very important. As you know, Professor Stanley Blake is a Brazilian historian, a Brazilianist historian, excuse me. Uh, uh, <laughs> probably, I haven't asked him, he probably wouldn't mind to be a Brazilian historian, but as it happens, he's just a Brazilianist. Uh, historian. Uh, we're very thankful for his presence, and without further ado, I'll invite Professor Stanley Blake uh, to the podium. Sure. Oh. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Um, th and th thanks for inviting me down. It's, it's uh, nice to make connections with other uh, folk that um, are interested in the history of Brazil, obviously, but uh, also the wider um, Portuguese world, let's put it that way, and um, it's it's really a, a pleasure uh, to have uh, the speaker today, Luis Felipe de Castro, speak. Um, he's the editor, um, and some of you may know this, but he's the uh, was the editor of a volume of the Historia da Vida Privada do Brasil, um, which I think was published uh, in what. Year 2000 was that that did that volume come out? Or was 97. 97. So a few years. I was looking at a, at a slightly more recent um, edition of that. But he is also the author of uh, a book that was published in the year 2000 called Intrapidus Vivantes: Formação do Brasil no Atlântico Sul. And this book uh, has been very significant for historians of Brazil. And I think what it's done is that, and I was thinking about this last night uh, and the night before as I was, as I was reading uh, bits and pieces of it, is it's 
forced historians of Brazil to reconceptualize the way that we think of Brazilian history, and not just the colonial period. And, and Alan Costa's focus is on the 17th uh, and 16th centuries. Uh, but it is, for me, uh, even in, in doing this preliminary reading of it, it has revealed uh, the hugely important connections between Brazil and Africa, especially Angola, uh, during the colonial period. And I, I was sort of laughing about this because I'm teaching a world history class, um, and I think I need to rewrite my lecture for next Tuesday when I'm talking <laughs> about the colonial period in Brazil. And that's, uh, so I've been thinking a little bit about how I'm going to do that. Um, so as I'm doing that this weekend, I'll, I'll be thinking of you um, and, and thanking you for that. Um, this book, you know, we were just talking a little bit about it. Uh, he's currently working on an English translation uh, to the book, which is going to be published uh, soon, I think, with the University of Texas Press. Uh, so that'll be available in English. Um, and I think that's well-deserved um, if, if you're not able to read that in Portuguese. Um, the title of this talk today is Atlantic History uh, and South Atlantic History, an appraisal. Uh, and he'll be talking. He'll be talking for about an hour. I understand, which will leave us some yes. some time for questions okay. uh, and answers and discussion at the end. So, thanks, Alan Castro. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Pedro Pereira, Stanley Blake, the staff of the Ohio State University, the Department of Spanish Portuguese. First of all, I, I have to ask you to uh, look my English, my academic language, uh, French and Portuguese. So I have taught the first semester intensively to be free, to be freed, because there is no sabbatical year in France to come to be visiting professor at the uh, University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. And uh, so, uh, the subject also I'm going to talk, it's a kind of new field, there is no textbook on it, I was talking with them before, and the lunch we have problem, I'm teaching that semester at uh, UMass Dartmouth, and I had to provide different kind of chapter and texts and uh, think because there's no book treating it, because it covers, it, don't, it goes to the uh, the continuous period, uh, that's the main thing also, the periodization we're talking about. Uh, th this link between Brazil and uh, Central Africa and Angola goes through 1850, when the slave trade finished. But uh, you, as we see, they restart again later on in the 20th century. So there's a continuum there. That's much more, that's my point, it's much more strong and much more substantial and much, much, much more pertinently, uh, historically, economically, sociologically, than uh, the idea of South America. So I am a bit embarrassed because they, I know the whole struggle uh, of teaching Portuguese and uh, Brazilian history and literature that uh, the fight uh, the professor in the United States and Europe have to have to distinguish them from Latin America that's mainly dominated by specialists on Spanish America and mainly Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I am complicating more in the things because I'm saying that they need to know also not just Brazilian history but South Atlantic history and even, I would say that it's impossible to understand Portuguese America, not to talk on Brazil, or Brazilian history without knowing African history. And I think I, I used to say that in Brazil, and like a kind of provocation, but it's used for some time that Angola is the main part of Brazil uh, till <laughs> 1850, because all the other parts of Brazil depend all on Angola to remain united. All of them depend on this intensive slave trade. Brazil, 
uh, it's uh, the m most important uh, uh, importer of African slaves in America. That's easy to see. That slave voyage, the database on it. But I'm going to start before that to talk about the Atlantic history. But that's a whole series of uh, studies on it. And. Uh, there's two kinds of Atlantic history there. I start with the American trend, which is not the first one, but uh, uh, I'm here, I talk first from it. And then the first trend is that uh, the debate on New England and American Revolution, and of course, uh, uh, the works of Bernard Bailey, and New England merchant in the 17th century, who oh, insist on the American roots, New England roots and Boston roots of the American Revolution as something totally new, as a rupture with the British history. So they really, uh, it was really a revolution, uh, cutting all the reference and the tradition that remain in England. And you have the other point of view, of course, I am oversimplifying, but that's the idea on Atlant the studies of Atlantic history here in the United States. Uh, the other idea is Jack Greeney, of course, or if you know or heard about him, argues on the contrary that American Revolution was also British Revolution, and there were a great continuity between the colonial and national periods of the United States. And his book, Negotiated Authorities, Essays in Colonial Political and Constitutional History. Gordon Wood, I am talking on them because I had been for twice, 2002, 2004, Andrew Mello, uh, scholar at John Carter Brown Library. So I participate uh, for a semester each time. I participate on debate with Gordon Wood, Jack Greeney and after I went to Harvard also to the seminar at Bailey. So the discussion is still going on. And uh, Gordon uh, Wood wrote, which is uh, a disciple of, uh, of Bernard Bailey, and so his, his first book on the subject was The Radicalism of the American Revolution. That was a very, he, he, he strained and he, he accentuated this point of the the radicality of the American Revolution as a rupture with uh, the British history and the British connections. But afterward, we wrote a book uh, called The Americanization of Benjamin Franklin, which is a kind of synthesis of the two-point view as Americanization uh, means. This, he, he, Benjamin Franklin was called to be a very important personage in, in England, but in, in the course of the events, uh, the political events in, in the United States, he became more and more American and took the side of the revolution. By the way, that process also uh, happens in Brazil. And as the Portuguese court went to Rio de Janeiro in 1808 and stayed there, Rio de Janeiro was the only American town to have an European, an European king, an European court there. It was the capital of a Portuguese kingdom uh, and the Portuguese overseas. So we, you have also a, a, a color, a elite of colonists in Brazil who are very important in the state, uh, in the apparatus of the, in Portugal before that and later on, and become Brazilianized as, as Benjamin Franklin in the United States with the events that happened in the beginning of the 19th century. I'm talking, of course, of Jose Bonifacio de Andrade, who was also a scientist as Benjamin Franklin, who belonged to the Swedish Academy, who had a very important civil servant in, in Portugal and become the leader of the Brazilian independence. 
uh, it's just to see that there's some parallel on this debate in Brazil also. But of course, we remain in Brazil the only monarchy in the Americas, so the rupture is not so obvious as toward the American Republic. The second trend in Atlantic history was also stimulated by the friendship the alliance military and politically and ideologically between the United States, England and France, between the First and Second World War, during the Cold War also, that the whole idea of Western civilization, the whole idea that was translated in military treaties like the NATO and all that, fighting before the communism against the central empires, Germany, and after again the Soviet Union. So you have this tradition also between the link in the Atlantic history that's bounded to the, the history of the 20th century. And uh, the main author maybe behind that is the French, Jack Godeshaw, also Palmer, an American, that wrote about the Revolution Atlantique. <laughs> and uh, he um, uh, studied the links between the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and later on some people also connected it with the Asian Revolution. So you have this kind of Atlantic Revolution that has a repercussion on the other side with people coming and going, Lafayette, Thomas Paine, and all that, and, and the, the idea the, and, and personalities also. In the two sides. So uh, that's another um, trend on Atlantic history. And later on, you have some developments on, on more connected with African American culture. And of course, the book of Paul Gilroy, Black Atlantic, from 1993. But all of these books had in common the idea of. North Atlantic in the whole Atlantic history. I take the last one, Paul Gilroy, because I discussed with him also in Paris. He writes about Black Atlantic, so it's a different point of view of the Atlantic history because they involve the African culture. But he mentioned Brazil four times indirectly. There's no study, no Brazil had the most important African descent population in the Americas and outside Africa today. And uh, he don't mention Brazil in his discussion. There is no mention even of the French author. He mentioned abundantly Gilles Deleuze, Foucault, everyone, but no Bastide, no Pierre Berger. <laughs> it means the French who studied African Brazilian history, who had an important author. He had no idea about the mulatto. The mulatto is the main, uh, the cruise problem or the cruise question about African history in Brazil. And he don't mention. So that, that's the point I, I'm uh, stressing here. And I said that to Jack Greene also as well, and Bernard Bailey. They agreed, and after they put a footnote in their book saying that <laughs> South Atlantic is quite different. What I'm going to do here is to show that's not enough to show put footnotes. It's quite different. But first of all, I have to talk also on the French uh, Atlantic history where I, I was trained. I did my degrees and my doctorate in France. I remained there for 20 years. I went back to Brazil and now I did there again. And, uh, I did my, did my PhD with Frédéric Moreau, who wrote uh, a book uh, called The Portugal the et Portugal l'Atlantique au XVIIe siècle, in 1960. The book, and uh, it's it parallel to Pierre Chonu's book, book Seville et l'Atlantique, uh, 1504, 1650. 12 volumes, plus two volumes of annexes. 12 volumes. Sometimes it's not even mentioned on the history of Atlantic. It's all on the history of Atlantic. Except he don't put Atlantic history on his book. It was Seville and Atlantic because that's, they are disciples from Brodel and they stood space. Bordel made his idea on history student 
student in Mediterranean, after he trained students to study the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire in the Atlantic and the Portuguese uh, Empire in Asia, like Victorino Magalhães Godinho. So uh, that's where uh, I, I, I learned to study Brazilian history. I studied from, from outside, from inside. Uh, I, I, I first learned on Brazilian history uh, studying in Rio de Janeiro in connection with Luanda in Buenos Aires, not in Sao Paulo, because Sao Paulo doesn't exist, and they, when it exists, it had no connection with Rio. That I'm going to explain better later on. So, but Brodeau also ignored Africa in his celebrated book, Civilization Mat Materielle, Economie et Capitalisme, 15e, 18e siècle, 1979. He three volumes uh, where he barely, by about 10 pages, mentioned Africa. In three volumes, there are no Africa. And basically used a book. He not even quote Pierre Verger books who, whose thesis he advised. <laughs> <laughs> and he published his book. He did, and, but he did uh, mention his book. As, as you know, maybe uh, Pierre Verger wrote an important book between Bahia and the Gulf of Benin, as trade and gold and bank. Uh, so what's about South Atlantic? So first of all, I have to define the space which is South Atlantic. So there is inside that uh, not just Brazil or Portuguese America in 1822, uh, but also Buenos Aires, because there's a connection through Rio de Janeiro and Angola of slaves coming through Rio de Janeiro to Buenos Aires and going up to Potosi, which was the main silver mine and silver production in America at that time, through Tucumán or over. Uh, in, in the late period, in 1848, there are even slave traders from Brazil who went to Cuba and Puerto Rico because uh, they were recuperating all the network that the Americans and the British abandoned in Africa. And there is a glut in Brazilian market, and so they want to sell also slaves in, in, in the Caribbean. There's another uh, network between the Amazon, Belém, San Luis, and Senegambia, because there is a slave trade company founded in the 18th century to, to introduce slave labor, African slave labor in the Amazon, in the second half of 18th century. And they came, and the same company, uh, Hull, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Compañía do Gran Pará y Maranhão. And so, in the, uh, in the 19th century, you have uh, the connection of Mozambique to heal the slave trade, because Mozambique slave trade was almost embedded in the ocean Indian, the Indian Ocean, pardon me and uh, uh, had no connections with the Atlantic. But when the court moved to Rio, 1808, it, Rio de Janeiro slave traders also attracted the slave trade from Mozambique, and 250,000 Mozambican slaves arrived in Rio, in, mostly in, five, in, in 25 years. And uh, so is what I call, I call this where the Atlanticization of Mozambique but of course, the, the main part of this connection is, as you said, Brazil and Angola, and Rio de Janeiro and Benguela mainly, and also Bahia with uh, the Gulf of Guinea and uh, uh, globally the Gulf of Benin, the ancient Dahomey Kingdom. So, uh, and you have, uh, as a result, that uh, during the colonial period, uh, it's in 1500 to 1822, and the national period, 1822 to 1850, when the slave trade finished completely, 
Brazil is the main port of slave trade in the Americas. Four million eight hundred Africans were disembarked in, in, in Brazil, and and the forty three percent. So uh, to to give you an idea, the uh, United them watch the United States and the United States received at least than six percent of the whole slave trade. And uh, I, I used to say every time I go to Portugal to do a conference, and uh, they don't like it very much, but it should be noticed that the fact that Luanda is the main slave trade port in Africa, and Rio de Janeiro is the main slave trade in America, has something to do with Portuguese and Brazilian elites themselves. <laughs> you should consider it. Uh, and uh, and that's that's the fact. We have now this database on Emory University. It's online. You can see slave voyages. You find every time it it is standard uh, information on a statistic of slave trade is regularly updated. We have some time. I participate in some meetings where we we'll discuss the update of it uh, and the geographic distribution of, of uh, the Africans we have in America. It's the best data on, on, on the migration of, on, on America. So you have nothing similar uh, to the Mamerindians and not even to the Europeans in America. Why? Because the slave trade was a trade. So you have a tax system behind and it less trace everywhere. And, uh, the, the second uh, factor important uh, on this history of South Atlantic is that uh, support economically and militarily by loose Brazilian colonists, Lisbon took central control of Central Africa, which was the continent's largest slave trade. It exploited this position in turn in order to secure even greater holdings on the other side of Portuguese Atlantic. So that's the idea. The Portuguese presence in Brazil, you have almost uh, um, 10,000 more Africans who arrive in Brazil than Portuguese. The control of a, such a big territory before the United States was uh, uh, expanded to the West. In the 17th century, the Bandeirantes were all the Amazon. They control, we have a cattle uh, network like that of West in the South and everywhere in Brazil. So that's, they could use extensively the human resource of Africa and mainly Angola. Since you are able to transfer manpower from Africa, coercive manpower, everywhere in Brazil when you have economic activity, and for instance, you, have, you may develop the gold rush and the gold exploitation 18th century without abandoning the sugarcane plantation in, in the littoral and the coast. That's because you have access to uh, the slave trade in Angola. And then was the geographic uh, significance to it. There is, uh, in the South Atlantic, an anti-cyclone, uh, similar to the Azores cyclone, but on the contrary, anti-clockwise, uh, that turns on St. Helens Island, more or less, that approach very much the Angola coast of Brazil. So to go to, from Portugal to Angola, they have to go close to the Brazilian coast and after go up to Angola. They arrive in Luanda by south. By the way, that's a route that uh, Vasco da Gama used partly to go to India. And after that, Cabral used to go to India on the advice of Vasco da Gama, La Vuelta. Uh, they have to turn and take those winds that went west up and uh, after they go to Angola. So it turned, it, it did develop a bilateral trade. That's no triangular trade in South Atlantic. That's the big difference. 
And I've been teaching till today in Brazilian universities and schools triangular trade. That's fake. They don't exist at all. In the 18th century, 85% of the ships were arrived in Luanda came from Brazil. And mostly 100% should come, uh, should leave Luanda to Brazil first. Why? Because there's no slave trade to Portugal. The, the, the commodities they export from Angola uh, to Portugal were ivory and uh, beeswax that could, because beeswax was used to, to impermeabilize the seals. What's very important, the cotton seals were, uh, beeswax is very light and could impermeabilize well uh, cotton textiles and the uh, seals of the ships. So you have those uh, commodities going first to Brazil and later per, to Portugal. And they do, are not, they were not going to tend the Africans first to Lisbon after to Brazil, the mortality rate will be disastrous. So the ships went first to Brazil. You have all this network of missionaries, Italian, Capucines, missionaries, and other countries who went to Central Africa, they first go to Brazil. And when they, when they stop there, one month, two months, they learn about Africa in Brazil first. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you have in the 17th century, uh, as a, um, um, a result of the Dutch intervention in South Atlantic that cut the links between the two sides, a counterattack from Rio de Janeiro, that's the first military expedition from Americas to Africa, which was an expedition, a fleet mounted by slave trades from Rio, took control of Angola, 1648, and expelled from there the Dutch, who f formerly had occupied Pernambuco, the sugarcane plantation, in 1630, and after occupied Angola in 1641, when they are expelled from there and from San Tomé uh, by, by people, colonists from Brazil, which I don't call Brazilians. Brazilians are people from today. I call them Brasilico. Brasilico is a word for that time with colonists born in Brazil that have no idea, no idea, no the premonition of the nation. That's a thing difficult to, to understand in, in Brazil, because Brazilians think they are... Uh, Cabral discovered the country all fat, all grown, and they have always been a history to show the, the, the exceptionalism of Brazilian history. Why? Because it is only vice kingdom that don't split. Portuguese America is Portuguese Brazil, Rio de Janeiro was the capital during 200 years of the Viscongo, the, the other Spanish Viscongo, uh, Viscongo is split. You don't talk on British America by itself, it's not Canada, uh, it's not the United States, it's not Jamaica. It's very different parts. You don't talk of French America, that different part, Louisiana, Quebec, and Martinique and Guadeloupe but the Portuguese were there all the time. So this idea of the centrality of the Brazilian story, Brazilian history, and the territoriality of Brazilian history, I don't even say a national idea, it's a territorial idea, that everything happens inside the territory and has to do with what follows after, which is not true. And that I, I, I'm saying, you have this connection. And so for people on, on the slave plantation in Northeast, in Rio, Angola was much, much more important than the Amazon. And each time they have trouble in Angola with the African resistance and kingdoms, Queen Jinga of Matamba, and uh, other, other kingdoms that uh, in the wake of the Dutch president there, saw that the Portuguese was in war with the Spain, a war with the Dutch. The Portugal crown was not recognized by the Pope. So you have the King of Congo, Congo who played his own card on it. He saw a breach of the international 
affair, and he tried to escape for Portuguese uh, grip there. And uh, so you have a lot of rebellion there. And you come from uh, over these rebellions by militias, soldiers, trained on tropical war in Brazil. What's tropical war? Against the Indians, against the runway, the Quilombo, the Maroon, against the Dutch. Uh, so they were trained in tropical war, and they went to Angola, where they defeat those rebellions. They introduced, uh, at that time, horse from Brazil. You have this cavalry, because uh, it, it came some cavalry of Brazil with horse, that which were uh, accustomed to be mounted without saddles and horse shoes. So the, uh, the cavalry had come to Brazil too, because they were not the, the it's not like the Portuguese cavalry. So the horse were also accustomed to acclimatize, like the soldier, to tropical disease, to what's very important sometime in Angola, I'm not to detail that, but you have about 4,000 of those militias in the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, who played very important role in some direct battles, because it was more quickly to come then from Brazil than to from Portugal. If you took people from a store, they all die of sickness the first week. And, uh, and the report on it, or Portugal itself, when they arrive in Luanda. But the people from Recife, from Bahia, uh, were not immune to this kind of disease, African fever, and all that. And so they were also habituated to, to, to feed themselves with maize, manioc, things sent to transport from Brazil. They drink cachaça called jiribita. By the way, this bilateral trade was also uh, um, it was also grow with tobacco exported from Brazil, from Bahia, to the Gulf of Benin in Dahomey Kingdom, and cachaça from Brazil to Angola against Portuguese wine. So you have a red manufacture done in a colony, export to the other colony that kick out the manufacture commodity that came from metropolis with the links between merchants of the two sides of the South Central. So you have this uh, peculiar space in, in the European expansion that uh, stands on to the after the Brazilian independence. And here there is a debate, you, you know the historians main debate in history is about the periodization. Uh, when I was talking about Jack Greene and, and Bernard Bailey, what they are discussing, periodization. It's 1776 was the rupture of a continuity. That's the idea of a, 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 the history. The main fact started that year or 10 years before or 50 years later. That the debate of the in history in general. That's why uh, Brodel talks of a longer 17th century that start in the 15th century, the Portuguese expansion to the Azores, that gave the control of the Atlantic, and finishes in the middle of 17th century. That's why Hobsbawm talking of a short 20th century that start with First World War and finish with the fall of the Berlin Wall that the periodization is different from chronology. So Brazilians all put the periodization where the rupture is 1822 with the independence or the arrival of the court in 808, which is important. We have 200 years uh, festivities on it uh, in 2008, a lot of seminars. Uh, they like very much in Brazil to talk about the westernization of Brazilian society with the arrival of the Portuguese court. What they don't say, at that time Brazil swallowed all the slave trade, because 1808 also is the, the year when the British and the Americans stopped their slave trade. And so all that slave trade fall in the hands of Brazilian slave traders. And, and Brazil is going to import the book uh, 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 of, of slave that were uh, created by this internal network, internal trade in Africa. 
that go to the harbor, the port, there are no more British or American, and a, a little bit of Cubans, Spanish, uh, because a part of it goes to Cuba also, but the main, the bulk of it, go to Brazil. So when Brazil became independent, Lisbon business were uh, put apart in the benefit of Liverpool, but that's the main business. The second place in the maritime trade was Luanda before, and Luanda became also the second more important port after 1822 to 1850. So the rupture is not so obvious. Brazil had still part of his body outside. He was still plundering Africa to have the growth at that time of the coffee plantations without destroying the sugar plantations because if you have an internal concurrence between the coffee plantations in Sao Paulo trying to buy the slaves from the Northeast for Pernambuco, that was in some crisis at that time, they would destroy the economy of the Northeast, so they could maintain the sugar plantation in Northeast and develop real Sao Paulo coffee plantation because again they have Angola and also now Mozambique and all uh, the rest of slave trade networks in Africa. So after 1850, it falls the importance of Brazil. So you can say your society has to finish there. No. It goes stay on because in Portugal you have the debate about the loss of Brazil and the debate to create a new Brazil in Angola, in Africa in general, but in Angola mainly. So in Portugal, the reference on colonization is still Brazil. That's why Oliver Lima wrote this book in 1808. Uh, Portugal, uh, Brazil, and the Portuguese colonies in Africa. It's a whole discussion what to do in Africa uh, after we have lost Brazil. And uh, in the 19th century, uh, it go on, and, and uh, there is a lot of uh, Portuguese immigration to Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro was mainly Portuguese town in the end of 19th century. The male population uh, was uh, uh, born in Portugal, was more important than the Brazilian-born population. In, 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 I have this data on this book of Da Vida Privada on the census at 1872 and 1890 in Brazil. It's very clear. So you have this migration that changed also the accent of Rio de Janeiro, much more close to Portugal, as it was the capital of the country. It uh, had influence all over Brazil. And uh, in, in the 20th century, uh, Portugal suddenly discovered lusotopicalism and Gilberto Freire. And uh, it became a tool to justify the Portuguese presence in Africa. So you have this debate on Brazilian history, the idea of Gilberto Freire about mixed relations and mulatto miscegenation in Brazil became very useful to uh, Portuguese colonialists by the 1960s, uh, in the end, when Portugal was most broadly questioned after the French abandoned Al Algeria after uh, the uprising, the, the, the independence war started in Angola, after Portugal was kicked out from India, after Goa was occupied by the Indian government, after Portugal tried to enter in the United Nations because it was not admitted to the United Nations, he had to renew, made an adjournment of his colonial discourse. And it took this Brazilian idea of losotropicalism. So that's part of the thing that go on to the end of the Portuguese colonization in Africa. And it still stays today in the left and the right, between conservatives and liberals, shares this idea of losotropicalism. Uh, I wrote an article on it. By the way, I'm going to send to uh, Pedro 
comparing mulattos in Brazil and Angola, that's, I mean, it's nothing to do. Because in Brazil, it's already 50% of the population are mulatto. In Angola, they were barely 6%. 70% of the Portuguese who were in Luan, in Angola, in seven, 1970, four years before the independence, were not born in Angola, came from Portugal. You, ha you have just 10,000 colonists in Angola in, 19, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, 1,000 in Mozambique. You have 400,000 in Brazil. They're not, the comparison is completely uh, out of question. And the, still, it stays as an ideology. The, the idea of lusotropicalism, that Portuguese had no uh, mark of racial prejudice, uh, because they, they, they have sons with uh, African or black women. But there's also another side of uh, the connections between Africa and Brazil. That's when Brazilian exiles, and mainly Miguel Arraes, who is former governor of Pernambuco, mm -hmm. went to Algiers in 1955. 1965, pardon me, he was all, at that time the main Latin American leader exiled uh, in, Al in Algiers. And the Algerian government of Bembela, which very much had some leadership in Latin America, he received a high of a chief of state. And the rise had a very important uh, role in supporting Mpela and Agostinho Neto, Amilca Cabral, and Samora Machel, who was very close with them. And, and so, also, there are Brazilian exilates in the independence war in Angola. And today, those countries become independent. You have direct relationship between them, which did not exist before. It's seven and a half hours flight from Luanda to Rio. It's nothing in Brazil like the United States. In Europe, of course, you say that's like to go to Japan. But uh, here you don't be afraid to take a plane. It'd be seven hours in a plane and a flight. I mean, seven and a half hours uh, flight in Brazil is like to go from Porto Alegre to Belém. Uh, I mean, inside Brazil, you fly seven hours. So. You have every weekend uh, ladies from Luanda who came to Sao Paulo to buy the clothes of Brazilian novelas, soap opera, <laughs> of the next chapters that's going to pass in Angola, <laughs> to sell in the markets in Angola. You have all the, the kleptocracy, all the, the crooks of Portuguese Africa who have flats in Brazil also. You have a Brazilian uh, transnational that are very influent. You have Brazilian church, a new evangelical church in Angola and Mozambique. So you have a whole connection that again built South Atlantic. Brazil has today 40 embassies in Africa, much more than Latin America. And then the whole space that will re renew the links with the past, so it's not a story of the past, and to me will be more important than the link with South America. Because if you go to teach South America history, not to say even mention Latin America, you have to, to do like a, a, a sausage you cut and you, uh, it was cut. You try to unite some slice here and like, but it's cut. You never form a whole thing, a whole space, because it was not. Brazil had no links uh, of the Andean states, except by Potosi and because of Africa. Brazil had no links with the Caribbean, except through Africa, again. The 2010 census showed that the majority of Brazilian population identifies themselves as persons of African descent. So Brazil is today a, a, a country 
with the majority of his, its population who is from Africa descent. It makes about 99.5 million persons. So uh, there you are. I mean, there is a new field of research. That's why I came here. <laughs> <laughs> to stimulate new research on it, because uh, it has a past, it has a present, you have a future. We are going to do a special issue of uh, the Journal of, Polit of Portuguese uh, Studies at UMass Dartmoor next year on it. I'm going to do a call for paper. And uh, I was in a conference at Tufts University last week that they have the yearly seminar of uh, Portuguese and Spanish historians on Portugal and Spain that were there. And there the historian uh, specialized in South Atlantic, first one I met in the United States. It was hired by West Point to teach South Atlantic history at West Point. It is a great interest in South Atlantic history. So I hope that Ohio State University will create also a field on it following uh, West Point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have some time for, uh, for questions, but I'd like to remind everyone that uh, there will be a reception in honor of Professor Alan Castro at uh, Professor Lucia Costa's house, and I have directions and maps for uh, uh, anyone who's interested. Okay? Immediately following. Immediately following uh, the, the lecture today. Yes? I'm curious. I'm curious. Uh, What, what center? Ah, Vienna, Vienna Mook. Yeah, Vienna Mook. Yes, yes. yes. It's just one previous explanation. Why? Yeah, yes. Another opportunity, if I know the author of Gun Steel, Gun Steel, Gun Steel, and he has an explanation quite different. Uh, I'm curious how he might answer that question. Yes. Uh, there is, it, it's obvious, it's very interesting. It goes from religion with kind of a barbarian thing. It has the uh, Walt Disney version between how you say to Patina? Uh, Alcor Truth and uh, the Carioca. Um, the Carioca is always playing and the other took his money, you so. uh, You have all this kind of explanation, who I think that's not very convincing to me. But the main question, I think that the Brazilian elite in the beginning of the 19th century thought that could Mountain the slave trade against England. Sorry. The Bra after and before and just after Brazil independence, when slave trade is a kind of have, a, you see, in the international treaty, it's like to have a nuclear weapons. I mean, it was forbidding everywhere. Uh, England had stopped it. The United States also. For instance, when Texas became independent in 1841. They, uh, England recognized Texas as an independent country. It could have slavery, but not slave trade. To, you can have slavery because it's common law, it's domestic law. And Mauritania had slave trade till 1983, but slave trade not. So the, the foreign office assimilated to piracy, even, slave trade. So Brazilian ships could be attacked in the sea without trading nothing. But the Brazilian government covered the illegal slave trade with Africa. The investments of Brazilian merchant uh, ships went to do slave trade, and the ships were captured, were destroyed. So Brazil went through slave trade, not just slavery, but slave trade, 
much more deeper than the United States. And had it, it's, it's like you see if you put today uh, infant uh, work, uh, allow infant work. It's like you put, uh, you allow people of 12 years old to work. I mean, in the short term, it's good to economy. But in the long term, you destroy a whole generation of people of capital because the production fall, because uh, you you're have no industry, you go through that. That's my explanation. You ask my explanation. I get that the, the, the burden of maintaining slave trade, not just slavery. And slavery was national in Brazil. It was national. It's not like the United States was in the south. The whole Brazil had slave trade. Rio de Janeiro had the most important concentration of urban slavery in the world after the Roman Empire. It, it had 110,000 slaves in real town <coughs> that have 250,000 inhabitants, 42% in 1850. You don't have a similar uh, pattern in the United States, you see. I guess this ends in slavery ended in 1808, 1888. Excuse me. Isn't that curious that the U.S. only received about 5% of imported slaves, and yet the U.S. had the most contentious problem? Yes. On the national and international scene, it was slavery. Yes, yes. No, yeah, but because the, the, the African-American population grew up also with migration from the Caribbean later on. And uh, the pattern, uh, the social pattern of slavery, and after the Civil War, the Jim Crow laws, the, the apartheid model that uh, stand in the United States uh, finished much more later than it never happened in Brazil. For instance, when books uh, Freire books was translated in the United States, 1952, that was an eloge from its search and miscegenation. Half of the American states forbid the interracial marriage. It never exists in Brazil. That was never forbid, not even mentioned. I mean, though it's a quite different pattern, you know, which not I, I'm not meaning there are no racism in Brazil. I, I wrote extensively on it, but it's a different kind. Yes. Um, I want to continue along the comparatism issue a little bit and go back to the way you opened um, your talk by talking about Atlantic historians. Yes. Historians, and I know you you have these conversations with Atlantic historians, so I'd like to hear more about what you say to them. So you said. You know, Jack Green, Bernard Baylor, and Gordon Wood, you've persuaded them to include no. footnotes, right? <laughs> not um, me, not but, just me. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, they, they're, but the, one of the messages it seems that you have for them is that it's a very different history. Yes. Do, is there any risk of exceptionalism, uh, continuing an exceptionalist sort of narrative by emphasizing differences and also, you know, if your message to them is this is very different, maybe then they don't actually need to pay attention to it because they can't actually incorporate it into course, their histories. Course, so course. what are the, I mean, no, is, no. is there something we gave by emphasizing commonalities too? I, of course, no. Uh, I, I mean, uh, much more important than uh, uh, Joseph Miller, who studied mm -hmm. Angola, with the main specialist in Angola, who teach uh, at uh, University of Virginia, Charlottesville, mm -hmm and whose assistant is a Brazilian, who is a brilliant too, Hokinaldo Ferreira, specialist in Angola. Uh, he, he knows much more on Angola than anywhere in the world. And uh, he went, uh, he was very close to Bernard Bailey, so he talked, he invited, and again, footnote with the well, I, it's, you are right, because the pattern, the model, uh, that's why I, I, I start to think that was New England history. The American Revolution was a New England history, and not uh, so. They are not concerned with the problem of slavery. It's kind of a, a 
uh, outside the story, a peculiar institution that was broken, and after war, you have a different pattern. And uh, so, uh, and uh, I, I get that the new generations start to work differently. Even in Brazil, too, if you say, uh, you see, even the archives are organized in this territorial fashion, for instance. When Brazil became independent, there is a lot of uh, official enterprise and, and demand for data and documents in Portugal. And so the Portuguese start to, to sell copies of the Portuguese document and break up the matrix of Portuguese document to fit in the political divisions of Brazil. So, you have a, a discussion on the Overseas Council in Portugal about the whole region or with, between the connection between Brazil and Angola. And so it's cut off, cut literally the paper. And there is a box of a competency in Brazil that, in fact, actually was not a competency at all, but it's a federate state today. So they put it was a competency. They put the paper in that box, the paper in the other box, and the paper on Angola are on Angola. So what happened? You have paper on Angola dealing with Brazilian history, and had paper in Brazilian box dealing with Angola history. Paper on Quilombo de Palmares, for instance, to, to the known specialists, I would say that's most important maroon uh, society community of the Americas. Uh, it stand the whole 17th century, north in Brazil. And uh, you have military who fought against these runaway slaves that went after to Angola. And so you have their biography there. And they are telling that they were in that attack in Pernambuco and they saw that and that, you see? So even the organization of their archives is anachronist on it. If the history of the Jesuits, when the Jesuits, the Evora, the Evora Library, who had the collections of the Jesuit documents on Indians, or, or on everything. So the Jesuits in Angola asked to the Jesuits in Brazil. So, uh, sometimes they were the same, because they went from one side to another. So, they ask, what you do you do about baptizing slaves? Should they be free? Ah, that's a very important question at the beginning of slavery, modern slavery, because modern slavery is a regression also in the ground of religion. All the religion used to free <coughs> slaves who become adept of their religion. Muslims does it. The Jews did it. In, in Northeast Brazil. Protestant and Catholic, no. But they had discussions on it. So the, the, the Jesuits discuss what to do. As he, the families of the people who are not Christian are real families. You can scatter and separate them and sell the father here and the mother there are real families. They have the same question in Brazil and Angola. So you go to the manuscript, the documents are attached together, not together. But you go to the printed version of the, those documents, the discussion on Angola disappeared. <laughs> so I discovered that all the time. It was cut off to territorialize Brazilian history and Brazilian boundaries of today, not of the 17th century or 18th century or 19th century. and. Uh, in the other side, to create a history of Angola that don't exist too, because Angola, the uh, beginning of the 20th century, is just Luanda, Benguela, and uh, uh, some strip in the interior. It's very small. It's not Angola of today. So you have uh, this. It's like the United States pretend that California was already United States in the 18th century, you see? That's the kind of history they write uh, when they write about uh, Brazil. Yes, please. Thank you. I, I happen to be from, I'm from Santo Mendes. I see. I'm from Holland. So I have to hear 
Toque a bota loja, manda a senhora para a minha esposa, para a senhora. Eu falo para a senhora. Essa está lá no portão de justiça. Eu tenho que congratular você, mas é muito difícil de dizer. E uma das coisas que eu questiono é que, most of the time, the African history, that sense, that part of history, really very disturbing because the story, because um, the African part is more you know, written by Africans. Most of the time, are written by Catholic Church and um, Vatican. And uh, finding there to confront is really big challenge because Vatican was also inside of slavery, on against, I mean, pro slavery, inside of colonialism. So, they have obviously. But you have this sort of sentiment right in right history for Maria Madur, and we used to have yes. to say pass my hand across on me. And what we need to know about this is really the challenge because we say one thing that the body can say totally different things. Yes. And then and when you go to do right history you have to go back to the truth, which is our value and have question. How tell us a little bit how do you find how do you manage to find the truth oh, yeah. so well done job? You, you see, I say the question is many times who write who wrote the story about the farm was Catholic Church, Vatican, they have good and kind of a polata. But there's the one version. And then talking about um, Queen Jinga, I'm sure Catholic did not talk about it well. So she fought. She was not even among all her names from her son Nicholas. They will use one of the food. But if you approach these in God, they said, approach the people. I can't think of them. I'm all in God. So, anyway, just saying that uh, who, many times we would get by the day, we find the first people who were for colonialism. Mm -hmm. But he managed, he and many people have managed not to write it well with balance. How do you, what can you yeah. use for us here to get the balance to come up so well that you? <laughs> No, I, I, but first of all, in general, I, it's all, always a problem when you go in the middle of two fields, because people from Brazil say that's nothing to do with Brazil, mm -hmm. and people who are studying Angola and Congo mainly say that nothing to do with Africa. I had discussion with uh, Joe Miller, with John Thornton on that, Patrick Manning of people who work on Africa for years, and they have local also explanation. Then don't take it account. Uh, I was talking on Joe Miller books, uh, Way of Death, a very important book. But there he, he, he tried, I guess, to study South Atlantic, you have to study the matrix from the beginning. Because the whole is there from the beginning. And not like I saw, uh, I talked about the salami. He took the slice, here and there, and he put it all together because he he paid a chapter on Angola, a chapter on Portugal, a chapter on Brazil, but it did fit together because the addition of the part don't make the whole. He liked to study European, the Roman Empire, and and uh, after the Roman Empire you try to rebuild it. No, you have to start <laughs> from the beginning. You have South Atlantic before Brazil. That's why the subtitle of my book is Formation of Brazil in the South Atlantic, not in South America, which is quite different. You talk about the Paulista. That was a good question also, the Bandeirantes. Why you, the Bandeirantes will run away in the interior? Because they are hunting Indian. He specialized in Indian. Uh, slavery because they were too poor to be in the Atlantic network <laughs> and, and, and they were no connection with Rio de Janeiro at all. Rio de Janeiro what's inside what is outside. That's the question historian should put. To Rio de Janeiro what is inside is Buenos Aires and Luanda. What's outside Rio? Sao Paulo. Nothing to do with Sao Paulo. They are on domestic labor they are on Indian labor, they are praying the Paraguayan village, and they have nothing to do with the Atlantic. They are the best war in, in tropical areas, uh, the Paulista. No one of them went to Africa. They have nothing to do with Africa. The Portuguese want to send them. No, they don't go. The moment where this expedition 
leaves Rio de Janeiro to attack Luanda, 1848. The big Bandeirante expedition from Raposo Tavares leaves Sao Paulo, goes to Bolivia, cross the Amazon River, go to Belém, cross the whole South America, running Indian. Completely crazy. And to go back to Brazil, they have to go to Lisbon, of course, because there's no connection. <laughs> <laughs> they arrive four years later. Nothing to do. There are different uh, patterns completely. And so when you talked about uh, the, the connection, that's a burden also to go to a discussion. And I am very, very happy. And to me, it's much more in, important to be received as a historian in Angola. It happened to me some time in the conference. The Angola themselves invite me uh, as a contributor to their history. And uh, then in Brazil, or the or United States, if you forgive me. <laughs> because uh, Angola is rebuilding the country, rebuilding their history. They have just the colonial tradition. They have also a colonist tradition of historiography. Because in Angola is also, you have a Portuguese presence with Portuguese institution. You have a municipal councils, you have a bishop. It's not, they were not just in, in the beach in Luanda. They were deep inside. And you have in 6080 a book wrote on Angola history, Cadornega, on the point of view of the colonists. It doesn't exist in Africa. No European was writing on Africa on the point of view of the colonists with a tradition of oral tradition of three or four generations of people there already. It's quite different pattern. So uh, you see, to study Africa, you have to know Arabic or Portuguese. I mean, if you go to written data, of course, to manuscript, of course you can deal with other documents. But you have to, that's uh, the main thing. So, you have this uh, tradition also in Angola, and now starts in Angola a history of the country because there was, they have, they was in civil war two, ten years ago. So you have a very ideologic point of view still going on. They have still a cleavage between ethnical conflicts, the north and south. We talked about that. But I, I will, would add that also South Atlantic is not the only part that is has their own history that's hidden by other histories. You have several. And uh, uh, you know Sorbonne has a campus at Abu Dhabi. So I go, we go there, uh, my colleague and I, to give lecture, the class there, a very concentrated course for 15 days. I went there already three years following. And you have Arabian Sea's history, old, 4,000 years old. That is there, with the Indian, the presence of the India culture. Not Indian, because India don't exist. India exists, not India. But the Mughals, uh, the Marat, and the presence of India in, in Persia Gulf today people are talking about Iran, Iran. But the big gendarme in the region is India. India don't want trouble in, in, in the Emirates. There is a more, almost a half of the population of the Emirates are India. And he, he, India has his navy, its navy there. So there is a story also going on oh, on Arabian seas, which the north of uh, Indian Ocean that involves Africa uh, and, and that part of Asia. Uh, that's very important also. And that is not uh, reproduced in the academic stu uh, studies, because you study India, or you study the Arabic, <coughs> or you study, you don't study Africa or the Persian Gulf. You see, that's not the only example. When I, I teach there in, in Abu Dhabi, so I tell them that I made the comparison between Arabian Sea's history and uh, and the history of South Atlantic. That's a field.
That's a marker of the Brazilian culture from the 19th century during the Paraguayan War and during the conflicts with Argentina, he goes and goes through football games and all that. <laughs> and the, the Argentinians call Brazilian monkeys. Yeah. Monkeys. 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 The monkeys. Oh, the yeah. Prejudice. Brazilian also call Argentinians of many things, but uh, <laughs> are racist also. Monkeys. Yes, because it uh, is, uh, and, and you see in Boston, uh, I, I heard of Brazil that 200,000 Brazilian around Boston, or, or they are a new evangelical, a lot of them, so they are not at this time, but the other people connect much more with the Haitians <laughs> than with the Argentinians or Colombia. Or Cuba, yes. Or Cuban yeah. also, of yeah. course. Yes. Um, a question uh, regarding the well, has to do with uh, somewhat with what we said asked in terms of specificity of the South Atlantic. Uh, Paul here. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Paul here. The I think I believe he was a British historian that died about ten years ago. He used to say that uh, the history of the Portuguese contacts with Senegambia were instrumental to understand the history of European colonialism in the Atlantic North and South, or even to understand the history of Portuguese presence in Asia, or the history of Spanish presence in the Americas. Uh, the, the pattern was set by the history of those first contacts in the Senegambia. And I was wondering if you if you have, if you would have anything to say about that. What, what is yes. the relationship of that yes. with what happened in the South Atlantic? Yes, you see, the first book on Black Africa which, uh, was called Ethiopia in modern times. I mean, the Ethiopians were the Black Africans, contrary to the Moors that were North Africans. Uh, so uh, the first book is the Durara books, 1455 when they arrived in the mouth of Senegal. And so that book uh, was published only in the 19th century, but it circulated a lot. It inspired uh, the, the no, very celeb famous uh, Popo, Popo Bull, Bull Encyclical. You say Encyclical? Popo Bull. Bull. That, that legitimate uh, slave trade, that the Portuguese re reduction, uh, specialists we studied, because they, that moment the Rome fed, because they start to change north of Senegal. The Portuguese first change Muslim captives against no Muslim captives held by the Muslims. Uh, black Africans, and uh, they have much more slaves, of course, because they've managed them to recuperate their fellows in the hands of the Portuguese. So there were questions about it, about this trade, and the Pope 
advised by Portuguese king and Portuguese bishop, wrote the bull late in 1455, uh, saying that since those people come to Europe to be Christianized and don't follow in the hand of Islam, of the Muslims, slave trade was justified. I'm, uh, they are, the idea is that. And that goes on to the slave trade, of course, to Americas, because since you cannot help missionaries permanently in Africa because of the disease, because the wars, it's much better to transport them to Christian lands in Americas where they go to heaven. And Father Vieira was talking about the Portuguese Jesuit, <laughs> did a sermon in Bahia telling that the first migration from Africa to Bahia, often then the past to second migration from Brazil to heaven. He said that to a brotherhood of blacks and former slaves in Bahia. And Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederation, wrote that the Africans are much happier when they were slaves in the South than in Africa, because all the wives they will be slaughtered and killed and all that and cannibalized in Africa and in states they could become good Christians. That go went on with lay or Christian argument. Go on and that start with the call the first contact. And the, of course the Protestant also did the same argument. They go to the true faith of uh, of Calvin. Yes. One of the best books that I read last year was Marcus Redeker's book, The Slave Ship. Yes. Yeah. And I imagine that you know Marcus Redeker. So I know his work. You know his work. Okay. Yeah. The, the Slave Ship. Okay. This is, uh, Redeker was here last year speaking. Yeah. I think. It, it, it's, it's a wonderful book, partly because um, of how Redeker, who starts out saying, the instrument that made the machine that made this kind of trading possible was the ship. So he starts out saying, I'm going to look at the ship, but he ends up expanding out from the ship and showing how, what these ships made possible. But my question to you is, Redeker focuses on the North Atlantic. Of course. He focuses on the North Atlantic. He does an incredible job, <coughs> this is very compelling history about the North Atlantic or on the ships. But what about the ships that were used by the Portuguese? In between, were they different from? Were, were there all? Were, was there totally different um, calculation made in the construction of these ships? And was it a different kind of machine that made possible the transfer of Africans over to to Brazil? Um, yeah. Well, uh, so the Portuguese start the slave trade two centuries before the other. When the Dutch, for instance, entered the slave trade after they were in Brazil, uh, they, they completely took uh, Portuguese advisors to do how to do it. When they went to Angola, they took some translators from Brazil because the Portuguese was a kind of lingua franca, a pidgin in the whole network of slave trade. And uh, the Dapper, Alfa Dapper, who, who was a Dutch merchant who wrote a book on Africa, 17th century. There is a museum in Paris on Africa art, uh, artifacts and art called Dapper Museum. It's very important. And uh, he, he writes in the 17th century that the Dutch had trouble with slave trade because they don't, did like the Portuguese. Uh, they introduced for instance, it was a Portuguese uh, physician who discovered scorbut, what's called um, the thickness of Luanda in the end of, uh, of the uh, 16th century, Cristão uh, Novo, a converted Jew, Jewish key that was in Luanda. So they have much more knowledge of Africa than any European power. 
not to compare with Spain. Spain had no co connection with Africa because the Tordesilla Treaty put Africa in the Portuguese side. Even people who wrote about Africa, like Sandoval in Cartagena, he uh, put uh, staff to question Africa disembarking in Cartagena from everywhere in Africa. But he had also correspondence with the Portuguese Jesuits in Angola. And uh, that's why he knew about Africa. I mean, the Portuguese had this direct knowledge of Africa that helped them very much. But as I said in the beginning, the South Atlantic wind and route system was quite different from the Caribbean, North America. That's why they have this bilateral trade. Anyhow, you go, the, the travels between Brazil and Angola goes between 40 and 60 days. And it, it, it should be done uh, before May and after November. Because uh, when you have uh, a, from May to September, you have uh, summer in, in uh, um, boreal hemisphere and winter uh, in austral hemisphere. So the turbulence in, in this line in this parallel are very complicated and trouble very much in navigation. So you have to see that these four million and eight hundred thousand Africa that disembark, they just travel part of the year. So it's very much concentrated in some months. It, uh, you have to organize it because you don't buy slaves to put them die starving or thirsty in the ship or in the harbor. So Luanda had to build a whole kind of a reserve of food, of water, because sometimes Luanda, for instance, had no uh, good water in Luanda itself till today, by the way. They have to catch uh, one, uh, water from the Luanda River because it was uh, Salted water, how do you say from the lake? Salt, salt, salt water, yeah. Yeah, salt water, yeah. They, they could not drink it. So they have sometimes to take water from Brazil. And so you have all kinds of combination on it. And after, in the end of the 18th century, everyone, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, the, the French, the, Dutch, the, uh, the Danish, because the Danish were also in slave trade, and, and even the Swedish put money on it, even the Germans, people from Brandenburg, put money on it, knew that they have to have some kind of seal that is kind of funnel. How do you say? Funnel. Funnel. Yeah, funnel shape. That so. when, it, when it rain, you put this kind of, of seal, and so it capture water for rain, you go to barrels, so you have water permanently, you see they clean more, the thing, and I mean, the mortality falls everywhere in the 18th century. That's the statistic of the database, show very clear also. It starts to rise again during the illegal slave trade. But the fact is you have in this connection between Brazil and Africa, also seamen who were slaves. That's the only network who had slaves as seamen in the Brazilian ships who go to Africa. And there are a lot of stories of people who go back and forth, of course. I, so I don't read Portuguese. What would be a good book for me to read to find out more about the kinds of things that you're describing, the actual... Oh, you see the book of... of, uh, of you read French? I do read French. I also, the Pierre Verger books, Flux, uh, Pierre Verger, the only book. A guy I told the, yeah. that Brodel did mention. Yeah. <laughs> it's in 1968, and uh, he was his disciple. Okay, all right. It's called Flux Reflux de Noir entre Salvador de Bahia et le Golfe du Benin. Thank you. And uh, of course, Joseph Miller's book is very good also in English, Way of Death. 
the books of John Thornton, who is a specialist of Congo, Linda Hayward, uh, Thornton, and uh, Linda Hayward, a book he wrote with her, by the way, it is his wife. He, she specialized also in Angola, more contemporary. You have a lot of literature in the United States now on that. And you talk about the ships and about yes, the trade. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Joe, Joe Miller talks. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, as I said, uh, there will be a reception at uh, Lucy Preston's house, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to distribute some maps and directions. But let's uh, give a solid applause to Professor.